This entire segment of the series is inspired by an essay by Ana Clarissa Rojas Durazo called We Were Never Meant to Survive, linked in the description. Durazo writes, The criminalization of domestic violence created a dual advantage for the state. Perpetrator became the sole party responsible for violence against women, while the state positioned itself against the perpetrator and thereby as an ally of battered women. One big thing that came out of the women's liberation movement of the 1960s and second wave feminism was the so-called battered women's movement. The phrase battered woman is no longer popular, but whenever you see or hear about a rape crisis center or domestic violence shelter for women, such places exist because of the battered women's movement. As the movement advanced through the 1970s and 80s, more shelters and centers were formed all over the U.S., and of course, they incorporated as 501c3 nonprofits. Consequently, they needed to find funding to sustain their operations. Dude also writes in her essay that federal funding to address violence against women was a key strategy to align the anti-violence movement with the criminalization project. She explains how the evolution of the feminist movement intending to protect women from violent men came to grow parallel to the extent to which the state would offer funding to battered women's shelters and rape crisis centers. This parallel between such nonprofits and the state's apparent need to build more prisons and lock up more men, and of course disproportionately men of color, sort of crescendo in the 1990s with the Violence Against Women Act, passed in 1994. The act provided $1.6 billion toward investigation and prosecution of violent crimes against women, imposed automatic and mandatory restitution on those convicted, and allowed civil redress in cases prosecutors chose to leave unprosecuted. The act also established the Office on Violence Against Women within the Department of Justice. The Violence Against Women Acts 1 and 2 merged in policy the interests of the state to criminalize society, populate the cheap labor force of the prison industrial complex, manage the nation's shifting racial demographics, specifically a declining white population, by quarantining more people of color in prison and deflecting attention from its role in the production and reproduction of domestic violence with the interests of the anti-violence movement. To affirm and structure this merger, the Violence Against Women Act created the U.S. Office on Violence Against Women and housed it in the Department of Justice, the federal arm of the prison industrial complex. Thus, federal funding has entrenched the ideology of the criminalization of violence against women, doling out billions of dollars of funding. And the sad thing about this evolution of the women's movement in this context is that there were likely thousands of women working as full-time nonprofit staff in shelters and counseling centers. They needed money to sustain their jobs and expand services to help women. Consequently, the women's movement within the nonprofit anti-violence subsector, whether on purpose or not, helped to grow the prison industrial complex into what it is today, in the name of punishing bad men for hurting good women. If you ever get the chance, read Until We Reckon, Violence, Mass Incarceration, and A Road to Repair, by Danielle Sarade. She breaks down the four basic goals of incarceration. The first is deterrence, meaning making violent men not do it again. The evidence shows that incarceration doesn't achieve this. The second goal is rehabilitation, which is to teach people a lesson, to make them better people. Evidence shows that incarceration doesn't achieve this goal. The third goal is incapacitation, which is simply to force the violent person to not be able to hurt people while they're incarcerated. While prison sort of achieves this goal, it actually gets people to hurt each other more within prison, so it ultimately does not achieve the goal. And the fourth goal of incarceration is retribution, which is to make the violent person suffer proportionally to the violence they did because that makes it fair. The evidence basically shows that this doesn't really work out either. So the reality is that the incarceration of violent men not only doesn't make society safer, it actually makes society a lot more dangerous. Anyway, back to Durasso's essay. Through policy, ideology, and the nonprofit industrial complex, the state began to break into pieces the radical social justice agenda of the movement against violence against women. First, by prohibiting nonprofits from engaging in quote unquote politics, it separated interpersonal violence against women from state based economic and institutional violence against women. This individualization of violence excluded the experiences of women of color surviving the multiple forms of state violence. There's a lot here, but let me break down a couple parts. I mentioned this before, but 501c3 nonprofits aren't allowed to engage in electoral politics, meaning they can't endorse candidates or tell people how to vote on certain issues. But most of us as leftists know electoralism is just one political tool, and so this doesn't have to matter all that much. 
As I've mentioned once or twice in this series, what led Insight to publish their game-changing anthology was that they lost an enormous amount of funding after publishing a solidarity statement with the Palestinian people. So Durasso is speaking more to how once the women's anti-violence movement became funded by carceral state actors and foundations led by the ownership class, violence against women could only be framed within individualistic and interpersonal terms. The state splintered anti-sexual assault work from the movement to end domestic violence, while certain state-based forms of sexual assault were kept out of the discourse of violence against women. For example, militarized and prison sexual assaults, militarized border rapes, and sterilization and other population control practices. At first, women doing anti-violence work sought tax-exempt status for shelters. But the price of achieving nonprofit status became obvious early on as organizers were taunted with lesbian baiting and misogynist jokes, and as funders demanded of the institution certain policies and practices, including professionalization. Soon, funders were expressing their preference for degree-bearing professionals instead of community organizers. Organizations were expected to have hierarchical structures, and therapeutic social services were funded over popular education work. Ideologically, Violence against women became more and more a behavioral, criminal, and medical phenomenon rather than a social justice issue. When violence against women is understood this way, interventions and attempts at prevention are overly reliant on therapy and the courts. All individualized methods of intervention that fail to address and combat the social organization of violence against women. So what's the point of all this? And I mean not just this last part of the series, but the problem with nonprofit series overall. I think Durasso and others who wrote the Insight Anthology and those still critical of the nonprofit industrial complex overall would argue that socialism just makes more sense than nonprofitism when it comes to addressing gender based violence and every other social problem. The reason is if the capital we have floating around in service of more investment and more profit and more competition for profit were converted into universal health care, child care, education, and housing programs, the conditions that give rise to things like gendered violence would be addressed, and there would likely be less violence. And that's it. Uh, good riddance to this series, and on to something more interesting. Grossthetics. Mikkel V.L. Monk. Rodrigo. Sahil Shah. San. Zach. Isabel Abdullali. Katie. Streeter Sweeper. Diane Prado. Brienne. Lauren. Garbage Possum. Space Commune, Ashley Altman, Pablo Ruiz, Ulrich Volker Anderson, Jamie Smith, Labor Kyle, Fiona, L. Chin Rufu, Sam Lachance, Jen Garcia, Chaotic Capybara, The Appalachian Left, Dirt Knight, Halim Alra, Wes, Leo Samalati, Brighton Beck, Lauren Dale, Noah, S. Malfede, Ace, Super Arjuna Butt, Waltz and Kia. Posaso. Salamander. Coriander. Salamander. 